Uh, welcome everyone to uh, CTA's Red Purple Modernization Project virtual public meeting. Uh, we're really happy you've joined us and we really appreciate and recognize the time you're taking uh, to learn about the project. Uh, my name is Jesse Thomas. I work in community outreach for the RPM project. I will be moderating this meeting. Uh, so this meeting is a continuation of uh, several previous public meetings about the red purple bypass. And we're here today to discuss a new phase of construction that revolves around the reconstruction of the red and purple line tracks north of the Belmont station. Uh, coming near to the uh, south of the Addison station. So we are going to be providing updates on the RPM project um, as a whole and how it's been going. And then we'll be hearing uh, from some experts on what the community can expect from this new phase of work that we'll be starting. So before we get uh, started on the presentation, I'm going to explain a little bit more about how this virtual meeting will work. Um, as you can see, we are providing live sign language uh, on screen. Uh, there's also a live transcript feature uh, that Zoom provides. So you can use it in the controls down at the bottom uh, if you would like this to be a, a live transcript uh, on your screen. Uh, the, we are also going to be making a recording of this meeting and posting it uh, on our website and sending it out to anyone who registered afterwards. We'll also be doing a translation of that recording in, uh, in Spanish uh, afterwards as well. I also want to recognize that we're here uh, with Facebook Live uh, as well. So those who are, are watching on Facebook Live, hello to you as well. So during this meeting, we're going to hear a presentation from members of the CTA team and from the contractor for the RPM project, which is Walsh Floor Design Build Team. And then we will have a question and answer session. For the Q&A session, um, we've already received some questions from some of you that, that put in a question during registration. So we'll be answering um, some of those. And then during the presentation, feel free to ask questions that come to your mind uh, about, the, about our topic tonight uh, using the chat feature from Zoom. So again, in the controls near the bottom, uh, of your Zoom screen, um, feel free to put in questions to the, through the chat. We'll be going through those and the questions that we can answer, we will be uh, addressing those during our Q&A session. Um, and then we'll be also taking live questions as well. Uh, so I will give more details when we get to that point. Um, so we would really ask though that you keep your questions about the topic of our meeting, which is the red purple bypass and the reconstruction of the red and purple lines that is uh, soon starting. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to our first presenter, Tammy Chase. Let, let me interrupt. This is Alderman Tony. I just want to be recorded as on the call. I know I had a bad connection earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Um, this is Tammy Chase. I am a Director of Communications for the RPM Project, and I want to welcome all of you here tonight. Um, it's nice to have a virtual meeting on such a cold night, so we're, we're glad to see every, each and every one of you. Um, and a special, uh, when I wish a special welcome to Alderman Tunney. Thank you to you and your staff for all of the support and feedback you have provided us uh, during this project. Um, Alderman, would you like to say a few words at this time? Okay, uh, well with that, uh, we have a lot of information to cover tonight, so we will get started. Um, so tonight, you know, as you know, we are here to talk about what we call the red purple bypass project. Um, but before we get into some of the details of, of the work that's been accomplished and work that is coming up, uh, we wanna do a quick reminder for all of you of just on what is the red and purple modernization project. Um, the red and purple modernization project is actually going to be is is a multi phase uh, program to rebuild all of the red and purple lines between Belmont and Linden. Um, however, we are uh, just only in phase one right now. Um, that is what we are, are currently building. That uh, phase one includes three major components, um, one of which is rebuilding uh, four red line stations between Lawrence and Bryn Mawr um, to the north. 
as well as uh, the uh, all of the track structures. All of those structures are 100 years old and in need of complete reconstruction. Uh, the second part of this, of course, is what we're here to talk about tonight, the Red Purple Bypass Project, and we'll get into that more in a minute. And the third part is uh, redoing our train signal uh, system um, up and down the line. Um, we have a 50 year old signal system and we're replacing all of that, which will improve uh, service reliability and train, um, train efficiency. Next slide, please. All right. So as I mentioned tonight, we're here to talk about the Red Purple Bypass Project, um, which of course includes the bypass, um, but what not everyone realizes is that there's additional modernization work um, that will begin now that we have completed the bypass. We'll get more into that now on the next slide. So here is a timeline uh, that really captures where we have been and where we are going. Um, so, as you all know, we did complete the bypass um, in November. We put it into service um, and is now carrying uh, Kimball bound brown lines um, um, up and over red line tracks. Um, we uh, are now ready to start the next phase of work. Um, we have red and purple line tracks in this area that are more than 100 years old, and we need to rebuild those uh, century old red and purple elevated track structures between Belmont and roughly Cornelia to the north. So what we'll be doing here is we will demolish and rebuild the southbound tracks first, um, southbound red and purple line tracks. And then once those are rebuilt, we will do the same on the northbound tracks. Additionally, during this period, we will continue to do um, significant upgrades to the brown line structure uh, just north of Belmont where it uh, meets up with the red and purple line trains. Next. So before we had the red purple bypass, our red purple and brown line trains had to stop and wait for each other, which contributed to chronic overcrowding on trains and platforms. Uh, slowed service throughout our, our rail system, um, had a ripple effect that affected the quality of uh, the commute for our customers. Uh, as you see on the bottom of the screen, you'll see um, a, a diagram, of course, of now um, how the bypass works. Our Kimball or, or northbound brown line trains travel up and over on the bypass over the red and purple line train lines, excuse me, eliminating that pinch point that we had and contributing to more reliable service. So this was an important uh, component of the work we did, uh, we are doing in phase one. And here you can see um, uh, an aerial of the finished bypass. Um, and we did put it into service in November of uh, 19th and we've had um, hundreds and hundreds of trains run across it since. Next. And this photo I like because it, it gives you an example of how community feedback about this project, years back when we first came out and talked to you, all of you about this, how it informed the design of the bypass. Uh, you know, we heard from several neighbors, several of you who were concerned about what's the bypass going to look like. And with the input that we received from all of you, um, it, it informed the design and we gave our columns um, this, this tulip shape that you see to soften the look of uh, the bypass in the community. That's just one of the major elements that we um, took into in account as we designed the project. And there will be other um, elements to this project that will um, have positive benefits for the community and, and be more aesthetically pleasing than the old structure. So as I mentioned earlier, we're continuing to modernize the Brown Line branch that connects with the red and purple lines north of Belmont. Um, that work is going to resume in the spring and continue into 2024. Um, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later in this presentation. All right, with that, um, I will turn this over to my colleague, Mikkel Williams, and she will go into more details about the work that's coming. Mikkel? Thanks, Tammy. Um, my name is Mikkel Williams. I'm a project manager for CTA, and I primarily focus on heavy structural and civil elements on the RPM project. So this work that we're doing for the North Main Line tracks, it consists of the complete reconstruction of foundations, columns, and track work from approximately just north of Belmont to north of Newport. 
And additionally, we will also be performing rehabilitation work from approximately Newport to Cornelia. And this rehabilitation work will include a combination of new structure, structural repairs, and replacement of uh, existing structural members. Next slide, please. So all structures, whether building or infrastructure, are designed for a certain life expectancy, which we commonly refer to as service life. So the North Mainline tracks have reached uh, their design service life. And so it's, it's necessary um, and time for us to perform much needed upgrades and repairs. And one upgrade that this work will allow us to perform is to straighten out the track curve located at approximately Newport Avenue. Now this coupled with new structural elements and the noise walls that we're gonna install allows train traffic to operate quicker and quieter. Additionally, this work um, along with the new bypass track allows us to uh, increase our train capacity. And this um, means that we as the CTA can provide better, more reliable service to our customers. Next slide, please. So this is a great picture to show the extent of the curve that we see on the North Mainline tracks. Similar to curves that you may encounter on roadways or bridges, um, it requires our trains to slow down to operate through that curve. So smoothing out this transition allows our trains to operate faster and more efficiently. Next slide. So this is a rendering that shows the new tracks at Newport from street level, and it gives you an idea of how the new structure is going to interact with the community. You can see that the reconstruction work will not only include structural upgrades, but will also include upgraded lighting and noise barriers. Next slide. This is an additional rendering looking north at street level on Clark Street. And so you can see the integration of the new bypass track along with the new North Main Line tracks. And our design intent was to integrate some of the aesthetic upgrades that you see um, currently installed on the bypass to the North Main Line tracks as well. So the wave pattern that you see on the noise barriers for the bypass track will also be integrated into the North Main Line tracks. And additionally, you'll see a similar organic pattern on the structural columns as well. Next slide. And I will turn it over to our contractor, Don Henry from Walsh Floor. Good evening, everybody. As Mikhail said, my name is Don Henry. I'm the construction manager for the RPB area for Walsh Floor. Uh, we get into the preparation work. Uh, next slide, there you go. Um, as Mikhail said, in order to straighten out that existing track curve, uh, this historic 130 year old building, 1000 ton Caltrava's building had to be relocated. As you can see, we as you can see, we rolled it to the west 30 feet in order to straighten out that track. Um, the move is complete. However, the roof will be replaced this spring along with masonry restoration work that still needs to be completed and some work inside also. But right now, the building's down on its footing uh, in its final resting place. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what you're seeing here is a new temp track. And this temp track will be in service uh, around the end of February. And what this will do is this will allow the southbound tracks, trains to get uh, to get past the out of service uh, southbound, the southbound tracks that we're gonna demo. Um, the entire temp track that you're seeing here right now will be removed at the end of the project, including the steel and the concrete pedestals you see uh, sticking out of the ground. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here right now, some preparation work. We are actually drilling some foundations. Um, these foundations will support some of the new uh, track, stru or track structures, and it also supports some of the temp shoring that you'll see um, that actually supports the stage line uh, construction between uh, tracks two and three. Next slide, please. Uh, the work you're seeing here, uh, this work allows us Move, uh, move the southbound tracks to the northbound tracks in order us to uh, come over the southbound tracks and uh, construct it. So there, uh, during that construction time, the two westbound tracks or west side tracks of the structure will be being uh, replaced and two tra two, uh, then the eastbound tracks will carry the north and southbound on the two tracks only. 
uh, during construction. Uh, next, please. Uh, reconstruction process impacts. The next slide, please. Uh, this is a timeline of the work that was going, that has gone on uh, during this year, 22 to end of 23. We'll be doing stage one, which is the uh, total reconstruction of uh, state of southbound tracks. The two west side of the structure tracks will be removed and replaced. Uh, and the next, and the 23 and the 24, we'll do the uh, northbound tracks, which are the two east side of the structure. We'll take those all the way down and uh, remove and replace those and reconstruct uh, the structure and the tracks also. Um, next slide. Uh, what you're seeing here is basically what we've already completed, but it'll, it'll gives you a rendering of what you will see during construction. On the left is the demolition of some of the existing uh, structure we had to do earlier in the year down by the Belmont station. Uh, you will see basically some of the same things there. You'll see the equipment um, and uh, the, the structure coming down. The center slide there is the drill rig. We're talking about the drill foundations. Uh, we drill those, fill those with concrete and that actually holds up the structure. And the right one there is to build new track structure. That's us and we will be there with those with that equipment because we'll be installing uh, structural steel, erecting that, and then the track work on top of that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this talks about the lead abatement work that goes on during the during the structure. Um, it includes removal of all the lead-based paint from it from the structure in the RP in the RPM structure. Um, somebody gets somebody gets uh, blasted and repainted. The new, obviously, we don't have to worry about that. The work will occur in strict, strict adherence with all the federal and local laws to keep the community safe. The work includes hand tools for spot removal and power tools for larger areas that we have to abate. All, personal, all personnel doing the work are trained and certified in removal and disposal of lead paint. State certified industrial hygienist oversees this work to ensure safety and compliance with the laws. The workspace will be contained with a shroud and air quality around work site will be monitored uh, at all times. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, at this point, I'm gonna hand it off to Stephanie. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending tonight's meeting. My name is Stephanie Cavazos. I'm a communications representative on the CTA RPM team. Tonight, I'll be going over what you can expect when construction begins, including impacts to service, community impacts, and um, the plan mitigations. Next slide, please. So starting off, um, red and purple line service will continue throughout reconstruction beginning this year and continuing through 2025. The service impacts during this construction will be very minimal during this process. Red and purple line trains will begin using two tracks instead of the regular four tracks. Additionally, brown line trains will begin using a temporary track structure, as well as the new red-purple bypass. This will mean a new boarding location at Belmont Station. Purple line trains will board on the inside track, where the red line side is now, of their normal platforms instead of the outside track. Next slide, please. Next, we'll discuss how this work will affect you in the community and our plan mitigations facilitated by CTA and the contractor Walsh Floor. You can expect demolition noise throughout the construction process. We will inform you of upcoming works so that you can plan ahead. You can also expect overnight and weekend work during this process. In order to accomplish the most work in the fastest amount of time, work needs to occur when CTA rail service is the least busy, which typically happens in nights and weekends. Regular planned street closures will impact Cornelia, Newport, Clark, Roscoe, and school streets. Alley closures will be expected to affect the alleys under the CTA tracks from Cornelia to Belmont. Plan mitigations include adding noise blankets on fences and ensuring that no more than one major street is closed and no more than two alleys are closed at a time. Alternative parking for affected residents will be provided by the contractor Walsh Floor, who will also ensure that garbage pickup will be maintained. Next slide, please. And to elaborate a little bit more on what overnight and overnight work and the noise impacts means the loud noise and vibration will come from work including driving sheet piles running heavy machinery and other demolition activities 
Though some work will be required to follow a 24 seven schedule, the contractor performs the noisiest activities during the daytime hours whenever possible. Noise mitigation techniques such as the use of sound blankets and sound barriers will be implemented as needed. All loud activities will be monitored to be within limitations set by the contract, which is 90 decibels during daytime and 80 decibels at nighttime. Next slide, please. During construction, we will keep you informed with regular updates. We will continue hosting virtual town halls, small community meetings, and our monthly virtual office hours. Construction activity notices, referred to as CANs, both paper and digital, will continue to be posted as soon as possible. You can also sign up for our CTA service alerts, as well as the RPM scoop, which is our weekly construction project summary newsletter that is sent every Friday. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at CTA RPM for the latest. And lastly, you can also visit the RPM community office, which is at 5137 North Broadway on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. or by appointment. So I will now turn this over to Tammy Chase, Director of Communications for RPM, to talk about our Open for Business program. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. So an important part of supporting the Lakeview East community during construction is promoting local bars and restaurants, um, shops, entertainment, and other uh, small business venues throughout construction. And of course, as we all know, um, in addition to the challenges of construction that small businesses face, they're facing enormous pressures from uh, the pandemic that will never end, it feels like, as well as uh, you know, recent incidents of crime. So we are very sympathetic and supportive of local businesses, and we're doing um, all that we can to make sure that we are promoting local. Um, so to do that, um, we started a free open for business program um, a couple years back. Uh, it's a very uh, good and simple program um, to participate. Businesses simply, they register for free, and then we will promote them um, on um, digital and uh, uh, physical um, promotional materials. So uh, we created the Open for Business program um, with, uh, very closely with the Lakeview East Chamber of Commerce, Alderman Tunney's office, as well as feedback from multiple small businesses in the Lakeview East uh, neighborhood. Um, currently, we have more than 35 local uh, businesses participating, and the program is open to um, uh, more people, more businesses as we can um, get them to sign up. So next slide. So to reach uh, people who live or will visit uh, Lakeview East, we're using a number of promotional tools. Um, you, some of you may have seen some of the oversized graphic banners that we have on Belmont and Clark that say businesses are open right now and uh, encouraging people to support them and visit them and during construction. Um, those banners have a QR code that people can scan, a passersby can scan, and that way you can be led to um, all of the businesses that are in Lakeview East, um, their, their links, their menus, their websites to purchase items and so forth. Um, other ways that we are promoting local businesses include uh, through our um, RPM scoop that Stephanie um, uh, referenced, the uh, subscription um, uh, information about the project, uh, as well as door hangers and flyers distributed throughout the community. And of course, specific marketing campaigns, including the one that we have going on right now. We started that one during the holidays and it will run through February. And basically it is targeting people who live just outside of the Lakeview East and other RPM communities, encouraging people to come to these communities to shop, play, explore, et cetera. Uh, we also created a dedicated um, CTA website, um, I Support Local. Uh, that features all of our participating businesses, um, our neighborhoods, um, including Lakeview East, to promote how um, all the great businesses and things you can do in the community. Um, in addition, we have a YouTube channel that features interviews with small business owners. Um, these are videos that we also have featured on our social media channels that really allow the, the small business owner to tell their story about their business. Um, they're, they're worth checking out, I highly recommend them. Um, so if any of you um, know of a business or have a friend who has a business uh, in the area um, that would that would like to you think would be great to be uh, participating in the program, please contact us. Uh, we want to get as many people involved as possible. Um, we will provide our contact information at the end of this presentation. So with that, I will turn it back over to Jesse Thomas. 
All right, thanks, Tammy. Thank you to all of our presenters for giving us a lot of good information. Um, so we're going to move uh, from our presentation portion of this meeting to our question and answer portion. Um, so uh, like I mentioned, we we're scheduled to go till seven. Um, so we'll go that long if we have questions that take us that long. Um, but we hope to answer as many questions as we're able to. Um, so for it, uh, we're going to be having a Q&A panel um, of the presenters and then a few additional folks as well that I'll introduce. So all those who are on the panel, if you could turn on your videos and uh, we'll all come together here on everyone's screen. Um, joining us is Chris Bouchel, the project executive for the RPM. Um, Tony Opila, he's a resident engineer for the Red uh, Purple Bypass area. Uh, Jeff Wilson, he's the director of government and community relations for the RPM project. And Marcy Jensen, she's the public information support manager for Walsh Floor. So um, how to ask questions. Um, we've already uh, been getting a few questions in the chat, so that's good. People can, if you'd like to keep using that, go ahead and, and keep using the chat to ask questions. If you would like to voice your question, uh, you can use the Zoom controls again at the bottom of your screen uh, to raise your hand. Um, and then uh, I will be looking at uh, the, the participants and those who raised their hand and just uh, going in order in which they were raised. And uh, once I call your name, you'll be able to unmute yourself and then uh, ask your question. Again, we, we ask that you limit yourself to one question and uh, keep it to the topic on which we were talking about tonight, the red purple bypass area construction. Um, oh, and I should mention, uh, if your question's not answered um, during the Q&A, don't worry, we're gonna be posting a full Q&A on our website and sending it out to those who are registered um, after this meeting. So uh, stay tuned for that. So we are going to start with a few questions that were submitted during um, the registration. Uh, so uh, we're gonna start with uh, one for you, Chris. Um, this is regarding uh, construction noise. The question is, how loud and close will construction be in the alley behind Cornelia near the red line? I think as we talked about earlier, Cornelia is kind of the limit of some of the renovation work that we're going to be doing on the existing structure rather than replacing it with new in this area. Um, and I'll also note um, on one of the slides we talked about uh, a unique feature of this contract given its size, complexity and impact to the community, uh, which is that it has limits on the amount of noise that we can generate um, both during the night and during the day. And you can refer back to the slide for those specific limits, um, 90 decibels during the day and 80 during the uh, the overnight time periods. Um, that is a fairly unique uh, unique requirement in our contract. Um, the, the contractor has shown, uh, I think, good innovation um, uh, in terms of limiting that noise as a general rule. Um, we haven't seen them exceed it and where they have, we worked with them to mitigate it. So I, I won't lie to everyone and say that it's gonna be quiet. Um, it is construction, it is heavy civil structural construction. Um, but I will say that uh, unlike most projects in the city, this project has limits. Um, we have been able to work with the contractor to stay within those limits. Um, I will tell you that uh, these are not instantaneous decibels. They are um, one hour LEQs. Um, I'll leave that rather than explain it to everyone. Um, if there are some real questions about it, we can answer, try to answer it later, but it is a different way of measuring sound um, and it is something of an average over a certain time period rather than an instantaneous uh, sound that you may take on an on a, on a, um, application you would put on your phone. It's also a highly calibrated, um, uh, highly calibrated uh, measurement. So the noise is limited during construction to those levels. Um, it's not quiet. And I'll also say that those are kind of reference levels because they're generally the same um, noise levels that you see with existing CTA service. Um, so that's kind of the, the reason and rationale behind them is that's pretty much the noise, the same noise that the train makes. Um, although it is construction noise, um, it's set based on that level. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, the next question, I'll send this over to Tammy Chase. It came in saying, at any time, will, the, will there be track closures? Will buses be required to cover the gap 
and for how long? So one of the things that was very important at the onset of this project, um, when we put together what is now um, RPM phase one, is that we would continue service throughout construction. Um, the red line is simply too important to, you know, just to not have it in service um, during any portion of construction. So currently, you know, our plan is, is it's to do the construction by rerouting trains to various different tracks as we're doing different pieces of work. So we won't be shutting down the red or purple line um, and we're doing bus shuttles um, for this work. Um, what we will do is we will have some um, uh, track suspension work, uh, track suspension on the brown line um, to do some work um, in the, like on weekends um, where we would have bus shuttles between likely Southport and Belmont. All right, thank you, Tammy. Um, one more from our uh, registration questions. We received uh, multiple questions about train noise levels uh, after construction is complete. I'll turn this over to you again, Chris. The question is, how will the noise from trains change and why? So as a, as a general rule, there's a pretty simple answer to this question, which is uh, the noise, as we complete construction and improve the structure, um, the noise levels will not increase. And, and you, you saw in one of the earlier slides where we said, as we put in the, um, the concrete structure with the closed deck, replacing the older um, open deck seal structure, that the, the noise will be less, uh, there'll be a reduced noise as a result of those modernized structures. Um, so that's that's certainly true, depending on where you may sit in in regard to the project. But also, as a general rule, the reason that we're putting in these new structures to modernize the CTA is to build for service over the next hundred years. And our hope is, once we get beyond the pandemic, that we'll continue to see um, increasing ridership over that entire time period. And this structure is really built to accommodate that increasing structure. So even with additional service. Um, planned for the future, and by the future, I do mean stretching out um, well in advance, well well beyond the time that we'll see recovery of full CTA service due to the pandemic. Um, we won't see additional noise because of the modernity of the structure. So, you may see reduced noise if you are now living in an area with open deck steel structure. Um, uh, you may see reduced noise. Um, but in general, the noise of the whole system in this area will remain the same over time um, as we increase service as well. So a little bit of complexity there. Um, you will also see noise, noise vary over time um, as we do various pieces of work. For example, Don talked in a, a little bit about uh, the demolition of the tracks um, on the west side, the, the, the southbound tracks. Um, as those tracks are removed and we put service over the west uh, on the uh, eastbound side, those of you on the west may hear a little bit of a reduction, temporary reduction in noise um, because the trains have moved further away from you. Additionally, we may need to slow down some of the trains in various areas if we're doing specialized pieces of heavy civil structural work. If say the allowed speeds in the area are 35 miles an hour, we may reduce to 25, or if it's 25, we may reduce temporarily to 15. You'll also see a reduction in noise associated with, with that as we're doing the work. Um, but ultimately, kind of between now and 2025, the noise levels will be in fluctuation relative to the trains. As we reach the completion of the project, the noise levels ultimately won't increase. Um, and in some areas, depending on what your relationship is to the track, you may see a decrease. Um, so no increases, um, and you could see a decrease is an answer to the question of how will the work ultimately affect the um, noise that's uh, generated by the CTA over time. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, all right, we're going to move on. I'm not seeing any um, hands raised at the moment, so I'm going to go to some questions that are coming in through the chat throughout the presentation and, and right now. Um, so the first one, I'm going to actually stick with you, Chris, on this one. Um, will there be places to sit at the Belmont platforms? I'm a little confused by that question because, as I see it, there are there are places currently to sit um, on the platform at Belmont. Um, we're certainly not doing substantive work as part of this project to the platforms at Belmont. Um, there will be a, occasional boarding changes that we'll make announcements um, through our various newsletters and outreach in, in advance of it. Um, 
uh, but there, there are no plans to either add or take away seating or do any substantive construction to the, to the Belmont platforms. Thank you. Um, Chris, since you mentioned the, um, the uh, boarding changes, we've had a couple of questions about that as well. Um, can you describe boarding changes at Belmont in this coming phase, says one person, and another one says, um, can we go back to the slide that talks a little and talk a little bit more in depth about the boarding changes slide? You know, the boarding changes, um, we'll put those out in association with our various notifications um, as we get ready to, to do the work. Um, so in, in this meeting, I, I think we're looking at a little bit longer time frame and explaining some broad impacts. Um, if folks have specific questions, um, we'll try to answer them either via email or we'll answer them periodically with various updates associated with different phasing of the work. Um, so I'm going to sidestep that one just a little bit because it is an incremental change um, that occurs with various configurations. Um, most of the changes aren't significant um, and there'll be both notification as you enter the station as well as notification um, via various alerts ahead of time. Thank you. Okay, um, I will keep going on a couple. Oh, actually, I'm getting a few hands raised. Uh, looks like first one is from Kathy, Kathy Powers, if you want to go ahead and unmute. What I was going to say is there is no seating at Belmont. There's no seating at Fullerton. Sometimes, sometimes I've had to stand for 40 minutes when there's been delays with the red line. There is no seating up there. Ka I'm Kathy, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry that there's, there's no accommodations for you at that station. And I, and I, if, if, if it doesn't work for you or there's issues, um, I'll, I, I don't, I won't disagree. I'll only say that we're not making, we're not making any changes to that station as part of this project. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I see another hand uh, from Chester. Chester, could you unmute and go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, I'm a long retired civil Ooh, Chester, we're, I'm not hearing you. Are people hearing him? No. <laughs> if you're still speaking, we can't hear you. Chester, why don't we come? Why don't we come back to Chester and give him another try? Yes. Uh, if you need to refresh or something, go ahead and raise your hand again once you make an adjustment. It's like you're unmuted. Can you? No. Okay. Raise your hand again, Chester, if you want to come back. Try again. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm going to go back to a couple of questions we've been getting in the chat. Um, I've got two here. I want to send over to Don. Uh, the first one here uh, about the structure of the new tracks being built. Will this structure be solid concrete rail beds or, or will there be wooden ties the ooze tar all over everything like at the Wilson red line? <laughs> well, right now it's going to be a cl completely closed deck just up to north of um, Newport and everything pretty much just north of Newport there Cornelia, Cornelia will be wooden ties. All right, thank you. Another one for you, Don. Um, will you use the gantry here? And I believe that would be referring to the large gantry piece of equipment that's being used up in the Lawrence to Bryn Mawr area. Uh, no, unfortunately, we will not be using the gantry on this project. Okay. You say, unfortunately, maybe you're a little jealous. Uh, I think we could use it at certain areas, but it'd be pretty <laughs> difficult. But no, there's no, no intention to use any type of gantry crane over here. Right. All right. Thanks, Don. Um, let's see. I'll go back to our hands. Looks like Chester, you have your hand up again. Can we give it another try? Go ahead and unmute. Let's try again. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm a long retired. So they worked for the city, and I was astounded at the size of the case tents 
used for the, the your structure. I believe there were 11 foot diameter, 55 foot speed doors. And I said, out of curiosity, how many truckloads required to, to, to form those caissons? Extraordinary. Let me uh, try and summarize, Chester. You're I, going a little in and out. I got, um, what he, I got what he was asking. Go ahead. So, Chester, the, the caissons that we drilled for the, that you already saw up north by, or south by Belmont, those were twice as large as the ones we're going to drill for this next section. The one we're drilling for the main line uh, for both sections, for northbound and southbound, are basically between four and five foot diameters. Um, I can't, I, I'm going to tell you it's about 80 to 90 yards of concrete with basically about eight or nine trucks. Okay. Thanks, Don. Thank you, Chester, for the question. All right, I'm going to go back to a, uh, some chat questions. Uh, this one, it looks like I will send this over to Jeff Wilson. When will the land be temporarily cleared for construction purposes for the various projects, such as Belmont Station reconstruction and on North, be turned over to developers and be rebuilt? Thank you, Jesse. So part of the uh, land that is being utilized right now for the contractor to actually use for storage and equipment um, will be in use uh, throughout the rest of the, the contract. So basically up until 2025. So when the uh, project starts coming to an end is when we're going to start reaching out to um, different developers and the aldermen and the elected officials to uh, work with the TOD report, which is a, a report, the Transit Oriented Development Report is uh, a report that the CTA had commissioned at the beginning of this project for the best use uh, of that land. Um, and that was with community input and elected officials input. And uh, I can provide you with that link uh, to the full report if you'd like, just uh, send me your email address and I'd be more than happy to send you the report. Um, but uh, as the project comes towards the end uh, is when uh, we'll start looking at soliciting uh, the uh, RFPs for the, uh, for the land. Yeah, I would just also like to add um, to what Jeff said. Um, we we're happy to send you the report, but they are posted online on our website at transitchicago.com forward slash RPM. You can see all of the the, the uh, potential developable developable parcels of land and the proposed um, uses for them, you know, the types of development. And again, as Jeff said, that this was done with community input, with real estate developer experts, um, you know, weighing in on what what it was, what could really be built on these parcels. So it's 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 definitely something we've committed to and, and I encourage you to take a look at the report. All right. Thank you, Jeff and Tammy for the for the answer. All right, this uh, next one, I'm going to pass over to Tony. Um, the question is, uh, will all the tracks between Belmont and Ad Addison be less than 100 years old when completed, or will there still be some century-old track remaining? Uh, thank you, Jesse. The goal of the project is to replace all the track structure and tracks from the Belmont station to the Addison station to, and the new structural will meet the uh, new service life requirements of hundred years. Okay. Um, the next question I will send over to Tammy. I am curious if we have an RPM phase two in the works as well. Is CTA going to consider replacing the Sheridan S curve? We, we actually get that question a lot. Um, Sheridan is a, a very special station to the CTA and the infrastructure team. Um, in all seriousness, yes, as I mentioned um, at the beginning of the presentation, um, the RPM program is multiple phases. It is all of the stations and tracks between um, Belmont on the south and Linden and Wilmette on the north, um, except for the Wilson station, which was rebuilt a few years ago. 
Um, and because of the magnitude of the project, we have to do it in multiple phases. Um, the future phases of RPM is currently under study right now. CTA has is working with a consultant to look at all of all of the aspects of what the future phases should be, what makes sense to build, which pieces should be built at different points, how would we fund it. Um, so with, with Sheridan, Sheridan has a number of challenges. Um, the curve, as you noted, is, is one of them. That's um, something that, of course, slows train speeds um, and, 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 and affects uh, service reliability. Uh, the, the location of the station itself, which is right um, in the middle um, and attached to adjacent buildings, that is a major factor. Um, that's, that's a complicated project. It will be rebuilt in a future phase. I can't tell you yet how what will happen to the curve? Well, will there be a new station? Will there be some attempt to rebuild it in the existing location? There's a lot of really complicated questions to be answered and a lot to be analyzed. But I can tell you it will be rebuilt in a future phase. And we are aware of, of the many shortcomings of, of that station and the frustrations for our customers. All right, thank you. Um, we have no other people raising their hand right now, so I'll keep going in the chat. A um, couple questions here. Um, I'll start with um, I'll start with one. I, I guess I'll I'll send this over to Don and Tony to kind of ta tag team this one. Uh, it says, aside from the lead paint mitigation, what other work is being done on the brown line portion? Tony, I can take this if you want. Sure. Okay, so uh, the brown line will have more rehab on, uh, on the structure there. What we did last year was we um, uh, replaced some of the uh, columns and, uh, um, uh, hold on a minute. So I was going in two separate places. We have a lot of angles, top flange, bottom flange angles that we're going to remove and replace. Uh, we got some cross critter angles we're going to replace. Uh, we have some existing, we're going to drill some new microfile and then we're going to put new, uh, uh, new columns up on the west side of the structure as we did on the east side, or I'm sorry, on the south side of the structure as we did on the north side last year. So we're going to remove and replace that. So we'll put new foundations in the ground, new columns on top of that, and tie them into the existing structure. Um, and we'll and we'll finish painting it. And I, we still have from we still have about two spans to go to finish painting. But for the most part, it's just removing and replacing a bunch of flanges and angles and new uh, columns and foundations on the south side this year. And that'll finish it up. And I guess the only thing I'll add is what Don was to Don was saying. Uh, all these improvements uh, strengthen the structure to make it last uh, a longer period of time and make it a smoother ride for uh, the uh, the patrons and uh, for CTA's operations. All right. Thank you both. Thank you for the question and the answers. All right. Um, I think I have a couple here uh, from the chat uh, for Chris. Chris, I'm not seeing your video. Just making sure you're still with us. Oh, definitely still with yeah. you. Great. <laughs> um, we got another one about noise. Um, how loud is a decibel? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, I, I guess kind of starting working backwards to my earlier reference um, between 80 and 90 decibels is roughly the sound of the train if you were standing in the area of an older steel structure and a train was going over your head that's a pre and I, when i say decibels in this case i mean an average over an hour um, so the, the instantaneous reading as a train is directly over your head probably higher um, so let's say in the neighborhood of 80 to 100 in an instantaneous level, um, 80 to 90, depending on day night frequency of trains over a course of an hour, um, when taken as, a, as an average or an equivalent um, energy level uh, uh, over, uh, over time, over an hour in this case. So one decibel um, is probably something that to most of us, unless we're highly skilled, um, 
sound engineers or um, highly trained musicians is probably not discernible. Um, so one decibel level, one may not even be able to, under ordinary circumstances, hear that. Um, maybe it would be the, the sound that your watch would make if you put it a couple inches away from your ear and you had pretty good hearing. Um, most people can hear the difference of about three to four decibels. Um, so that's, that's kind of the threshold of um, really being able to, to hear a sound for most of us. And then it would go up to some of the louder things that you would experience um, at an airport um, underneath a, a, a CTA structure when the train goes over um, in the area of a highway. Uh, rolling down your windows as you're driving down, uh, driving down the highway, something on that level. So Kathy, I, I don't know that I can give you a good description of exactly what a decibel is, but it is a measure of sound um, and ultimately a measure of, of energy, um, which is one reason why we can take it um, as an average uh, uh, over time. Um, it is a little complicated and nonlinear because it's actually logarithmic. And I'm not going to attempt in a public meeting to explain um, how a logarithmic measure works. I think I get in way over my head. Um, but uh, if you really have further questions on it, uh, please put them in the chat and we'll endeavor to um, answer them online. I'll get an expert um, who knows more about logarithms than I do. Maybe Don, are you are you good with logarithms? No, no, you got you don't have your slide rule with you. Um, all right, sorry, I can't be more specific than that, Kathy. Um, Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks, Kathy, for the question. Um, I, I think I'll stick with you, Chris, and then if anyone else wants to chime in on this one as well, feel free. Uh, this question is also about the structure of the new tracks being built, uh, and the new track structure. With the closed deck configuration, what considerations have been given for water runoff and snow accumulation? Oh, no, we have an engineer in the audience. We have more than one engineer. I think we've already, um, we have, we have one that we talked about with the concrete. Um, so it, it is, it is actually a complicating factor. There's a lot of benefits to a closed deck structure. Um, you know, it, with the concrete plinths and the concrete fasteners and some other features of the rail, it is a smoother ride. Um, it's a quieter ride, both to our passengers, um, as well as a community, at least directly below it, even when rail surface service is increased. Um, but it does have some increased complications to us uh, at the CTA, one of, one of which is snow removal. Um, although I'll tell you that at the CTA we follow, uh, our primary way of removing snow is with existing service. Each existing train has a little plow on the front of it. Um, and the way that those trains run and how they, the frequency with they, which with they run, with which they run is generally um, our best tool to removing snow. Um, there are some circumstances on ballasted track um, that would be to the north of here or on some of the expressways where we would actually use a special piece of heavy equipment on the overnight um, to, to uh, remove snow, basically a huge um, train operated snowblower that some of you may have seen out there. Um, and then we have smaller tools um, that are called brooms, and we use them in the course of track maintenance, um, really to, to dress the ballast um, and to, to configure the ballast in a certain way. But then in the winter time, we'll also use those brooms, which again are kind of big pieces of equipment that have uh, brooms on the front of them is what I would call them. Um, those can also be used for removing snow on the overnight in various places. We mostly use them in the yards um, right now, but if we had to, we could use them in other places. Um, on places like uh, the, the uh, bypass or the overpass, um, on places like the, the track that we're going to build um, under the bypass uh, up to Cornelia, um, that type of uh, structure has drainage with it as well. So it uh, drains down. Um, and in some cases, it drains into a retainage system that's located under the tracks before it drains into, um, into another type of uh, system. In other cases, up north, where we're doing the segmented box girder, um, that retainage system will actually be the, uh, the existing structure, um, the existing embankment that remains. That embankment will retain the water before it ultimately makes its way into the city and MWRD's uh, recycling system um, for stormwater. So I hope that answers your, your question. Well, well thought out. I, I'll tell you, I spent a lot of time thinking about drainage um, 
as we were we were getting going on the design of this project, it was a real uh, concern of mine and, and, and a detail that we worked on extensively to, to A, make sure we got it right, to maximize the service life of the track, and B, to make sure we weren't impacting any of the uh, streets, buildings, uh, or businesses in the area. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Chris says, thank you for the answer. I should say question. The, the question, Chris, thanks the answer, Chris. <laughs> okay. Um, I am not seeing anyone else with their hand raised. We have only a couple minutes left before seven. I'm not seeing additional questions that we can answer in the chat. So I, I guess we'll give it a minute. If anyone has any last questions, feel free to raise your hand or submit it in the chat. Uh, looks like we did get a question here. Um, yeah, I can answer that one. All right, Jeff. So it says, what will be under the track use after construction? So at different locations with regards to where we're doing the construction and where the track is available for either public use or uh, CTA usage, um, we're going to be working closely with the community and the elected officials, the aldermen specifically to find out what the best use for that space could possibly be for um, the community and CTA. So um, as we get closer to the end of this project and those spaces that are currently being used right now actually by the contractor for storage and, and uh, the project use, um, we'll be reaching out to the elected officials and the community to get some ideas what they'd like to see there. Great, thanks Jeff. Seeing about one minute before seven, if there's any, let's do one more question. If, if there is one, uh, again, feel free to raise your hand or submit through the chat. Okay, well, I, I'm seeing none. Uh, so I, uh, we're gonna close out the meeting now. Um, thank you again for all those who have come tonight and taken the time to learn about um, this new phase of construction and this, the RPM project in general. Uh, we appreciate your engagement and want to uh, keep engaging with you all. Um, so on the slide, you can see there's a few um, uh, ways to get, involved and in staying informed with uh, what we do in RPM and um, our communication channels that we have. So, of course, our website, uh, transitchicago.com slash RPM, and then uh, the red and purple line service updates that uh, come from transitchicago.com slash updates. Um, those are really good tools to be uh, keeping in touch with. Uh, we have our email address here, RPM at transitchicago.com. Uh, we, again, implore you to sign up for alerts. Uh, that is the best way to know exactly what's going on in terms of construction and impacts to the community on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you can sign up for those. And uh, please take a look at the different zones that we have. Uh, these are locations that are, uh, give you alerts specific to those locations where you want to um, get information about. Uh, so pay attention to that as you sign up for alerts. And uh, feel free to call us. Uh, we have a hotline number uh, and we get back to that. Uh, both that and the email is a real life person that sees those and we get back to you with answers as best that we can. Um, just on uh, the topic of answers, uh, like I said before, if your question did not get answered or uh, if you wanna just review the questions and answers, we will be sending those out along with this presentation, it'll be posted to our YouTube. And like I mentioned with the Spanish translation, um, please follow us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We are posting um, updates about construction, interesting things, um, information about the businesses and the community uh, all the time. So a lot of great information to get those uh, or from our social media accounts. So 
again, everyone, thank you. We hope you have a great evening. Um, take care.